The haze of addiction hangs over Salt Lake City. We have 6,400 offenders in prison. 85 to 90 percent came in because of drugs. Now, those on uh, burglary, on auto theft, on um, even some of the sex offenders, uh, the crimes were committed while under the influence of drugs. This is not about a number. This is about my family. My husband and I got together, Paul and I got together. We started dating in 1980, and then we got married in 1987. And that's when we brought our family together. We have a yours, mine, and ours family. I had two children, Claire and Scott, and Claire was autistic, and, my, and Paul had Amber, and then we had Shelly together. And so when we did get married, we had um, the four children. I'm Amber, I'm 29 years old. I've lived with my dad all my life. I grew up my first 10 years living with my grandparents and my dad. My dad got married to my stepmom, and she's really loving. She's tried to be my mom for me, although I've pushed her away. Drugs have helped me push her away, even my father. Um, my mother has never been in my, really been in my life, my biological mother. She actually was a cocaine addict and alcoholic. I ended up introducing her to meth. Bringing two families together is hard in the first place, but you know the kids were small, and and most things worked out. And then it started out a little bit of problems with um, Paul. Paul drank. I quit drinking in 1981 for approximately 12 years, and from that point to now, I have drank for. A year and a half, two years, quit for a couple years, and then tend to go back. You know, we started, you know, just having two sets of rules. Um, there would be my rules that I would do with my kids, and then there would be his rule that he would do with Amber, and and we we would, you know, it'd be conflict. I was first introduced to drugs when I was about 12. Peer pressure I started smoking weed, drinking. I think that's where most parents think once their kids hit junior high they can go on their own. And I think that's a time when kids need their parents more than elementary school kids need their parents because now they're under the influence of their friends and not the parents. And so if the parents don't stay involved and know what's going on, the kids are going to do whatever makes them feel good and whatever kids accept them. More and more the kids started withdrawing and Amber would, you know, she started getting in trouble at school. Most people have problems that, you know, once or twice a year and, you know, but every week there was something. I was getting called to school or, or you know, she was having trouble with a friend or, and you know, I, it's just like I couldn't, I couldn't keep up. I couldn't. I, I thought, what am I doing? And Scott would have the same. His his problems weren't as often, but when he'd have them, they would be big ones. You know, Paul and I disagreed a lot on discipline, on what are we going to do with, you know, one or the other, and or it was if one was in trouble, they were all in trouble. And so we didn't get a consistency. And I think that not having consistency was a big, a big issue. And Amber knew she could go to her dad and get away, you know, get him to go on her side. And Scott knew he could do that with me. And we had, we would just, the kids were playing us and we let it happen. Because of the addictions with our children, uh, there's been a lot of stress and problems between Judy and I in our relationship because the fact that kids are stepbrother and stepsister, Judy tends to go easier on Scott than, than I would like and, and vice versa. I'm real lenient as far as Amber was concerned and that's caused problems between us. 
Then when I was 13, a group of my friends were smoking meth, or crank meth at that time, and asked me if I want to try it. And I said, sure, what can one try do? And I was hooked on meth at that time. Both dealing with alcohol and crystal meth. Both addictions in our family, and I think most people, if they examine themselves, find out they're an addict of some kind, either alcohol, tobacco, drugs, eating, there's all kinds. But in our family, uh, the alcohol has become a problem with our son because he keeps coming home drunk. Along with that, on the crystal meth, our daughter it has escalated over the years to the point she's been in and out of rehab and right at the moment she's in rehab again for the last time we hope. Meth has just drug my life down. I have had a marriage, child, a home, car, had everything I wanted and I've let all that go for meth. During this last few months I ended up witnessing the suicide of my friend. I woke up with her about three inches from my feet dead on the floor one morning. And I thought that would scare me away. That lasted about a week. Meth is just so hard to get off of. And you know, I've experienced the worst. I should be at my rock bottom. Yeah, I'm still out getting high. Amber was staying at this hotel and she didn't have any clean clothes. I asked, I said, I told her I'd do some of her laundry and I took a basket of laundry home. And, and when I went through the basket, I. I found all kinds of needles and condoms and, you know, cigarettes. Our family is just in crisis over this problem. Programs that I've been in, basically I've done VOA day treatment. I've done, been in a VOA detox center for women and children four times. So far it hasn't worked for me. Um, reasons why I left. Can't stand being housed with that many women. Um, being around their children, not being able to see mine. Not agreeing with what they want. Get bored of it and leave. Um, first, I'm going to tell you about um, how it's caused me to be homeless. I've gone from motel to motel before. We came up with the money however we could to pay for the next day and still get our drugs at the same time. Um, right now, I'm living in Magna with a friend. It's not a good situation. There's drugs involved. There's abuse involved. Right now, I don't know where I'm going to live. And with her drug addiction and her drug charges pending, Amber cannot stay in our house. And therefore, she's out on the streets a lot up until she went to rehab. And we keep going to her rescue to keep her from possibly dying. She's OD'd several times. She had a friend that she was living with that OD'd and it just doesn't seem to get through to her and now it's time with the conflicts that's been through the family and the physical violence that happened. It's tough love time. It's either she gets clean and stays sober or she'll have to lose all contact with the family. She slowly, you know, killing herself. I mean, the, her health is bad. She doesn't eat well. She doesn't look good. I mean, the sores come out on her skin. Um, I've gone from when I first started smoking it and snorting it to actually IV shooting it. I can't get high any other way now. I experienced my first episode of cotton fever about three weeks ago. Not the funnest. Never want to do it again, but so I said I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to do it anymore. I went three weeks and I'm back on the needle again. Oh, cotton fever is when you get dirt, fibers, um, foreign stuff in, mixed in with the, the dope and doesn't filter out and gets in the syringe and goes in your, your bloodstream and you go get real hot flush, you can't move, you're shaky, you end up with cold flushes off and on. And the only way to get rid of it is to do another shot. And you can't do it yourself when you can't see, you can't move. And I, it took three people to get me a shot. It's no fun. And I, it lasted three weeks and I'm back on needle like it never happened. My natural instinct is just to shut her out of my life. I, it's such an emotional roller coaster that 
it's just hard to want to be around her. And then it makes me feel really bad because I love her and I want her and she's my, you know, my daughter and I want her part of my life. But I don't want that kind of lifestyle. It's affected our families, feeling guilty or, or afraid to talk to people or don't, you know, not wanting people to know what's going on. And I think that's the biggest thing I, I see now is that instead of being ashamed and afraid, we need to talk about this. And this is an epidemic problem that is affecting all of our communities. This is a love buddy that Ellen purchased last night. It's got a pretty little red rose in it. Real cute little item. My granddaughter asked me to buy her a love buddy, but I don't know what that is. Love buddy in here. Oh, that little thing? Five dollars. What's this used for? I don't know. Novelty. Huh? Novelty. Novelty? Yeah. What do you suppose she wants one for? She's 15. 15 year olds don't have novelties. Yeah. That's a love buddy? Hmm. That's weird. I'll get her that one. Bye, Doug. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> This is something that can be purchased in any neighborhood store. It doesn't matter where you live, you can purchase these. And others on our crew show us just how easy it is to buy glass pipes. A pack of cigarettes and a love buddy, which is a flower in a piece of glass. You pull, let's see, I suppose you pull this little flower out of here, bam. Probably grab a pair of tweezers and pull that flower out, and you have a meth pipe. Right here, it's already blown, it has a hole in it. Drop your crystal in, melt it, smoke it up. I did not know what drug paraphernalia was when I'd find burned out light bulbs downstairs years ago. Now I find the currency of a user, syringes, condoms, torch lighters, when I do my laundry. I never thought, let alone believed, my children would use drugs. I need to let them deal with their own problems. I have a son named Michael. He's nine. He lives with my parents right now, and the reason why is my drug abuse and criminal activity going in and out of jail and now drug rehabs. I have a beautiful grandson. You know, here she should be this happy-go-lucky mother. Because of Amber, Judy and I are now, as grandparents, are parents again to our grandchild, which we've had custody of him for several years, and we've actually raised him from almost the time he was born. We've had him more than she has. We didn't know where Amber was half of the time. Um, Michael was worrying whether what his mom was doing. He got diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, he would just go outside and get sidetracked and say, oh, I'm gonna go play at my friends and forget to tell somebody where he was at. But we were going, you know, two, three times a day looking for him. And it got very serious that, I mean, and he would get, when he would go, he'd be so involved within himself and, you know, and getting distracted so easy that he would, you know, not be able to get home. He would lose his way. Grand Families was a support group for kinship care people, but then it also had a counseling component. Uh, Grand Families, the program that I am over, the director over, started in about the year, to, it, it started the idea about 2002, in the two years that we've been running up and running, we have served over 213 families. Patricia Totterer is my assistant. Patricia really has an expertise in working with children with reactive attachment disorder. 
My name is Patricia Totterer. I am a CSW, which means a certified social worker. Michael first came to Hard Work Counseling. He started working with me. He had pretty heavy issues. He had a lot of anxiety. He had um, a lot of anger. He was acting a little defiant and oppositional, which means he would defy grandmas and grandpas. Uh, attempts at disciplining him, a lot of those uh, reactions and behaviors were directly related to his anger at his mom because mom was not involved in his care. The positive side of this situation is that he had very involved grandparents. One of the things they did is they brought him for counseling and reinforcing the fact that he hadn't done anything wrong. At this point with Michael, uh, with his ADHD and also with his mother uh, being an addict, we've had to have him in counseling. Counseling was something I've never found to work in my past. Uh, I'm starting to get a little clearer idea with counseling, what it's about and how it can help, because it does with Michael. You know, when families are in crisis, like our family was in crisis and they helped us. And Michael, needed a lot of emotional help, more than just what we could give him. And so they would do things with him, and then they introduced us to a program called ACES, where Michael went there and he just bloomed. Michael came to what we call the ACES program, which is Acute Children's Extended Services. Um, it's just an activity I did with Michael that you can really pull whatever you want from it, theoretically. Um, it was the house tree person activity. And this is from when Michael, probably the first or second week he was there when I met with him. This is his tree. It's pretty small. When I had him draw a person that can draw any person they want, and he chose to draw his mother, who was also very small. And um, she said that she's sad because she's on drugs and she needs help. And then he drew his family, um, which is very kind of generic, not a lot of detail. They all kind of look the same, and you, Grandma doesn't have blonde hair, so it's kind of interesting. They're just stick figures. And then his house, which is very small, with no windows, no doorknob, nothing. As Michael went through the program, just kind of on a whim, I decided towards the end of it, because he, had, he was doing so well. His, his teachers and his school just loved the fact that he was really succeeding, and he was doing well in school, and it was a complete turnaround from how he was doing before. He was doing well at home. I just decided to try and do the same activity with him over again. This is the tree he did at the end of treatment. And he was in treatment for approximately about six months. It was sad because it had no water to drink, so it needed water to be nurtured and, and to grow, but it was much bigger than before. And for his house, there's still not a doorknob, but there's some little windows and grass and a tree. His family this time around, he drew much more detailed. Uh, drew his grandpa with a baseball hat. Grandma wearing orange because it's her favorite color. Um, Drew's uncle, and as he got down to himself and the other kids, it became very, you know, generic again with not a lot of detail, but I mean a lot more detail than there was previously. And then for the person, he drew himself, and there's still some, you know, the hands are missing, the nose is missing, little pieces are, you know missing, but it's himself, it's not his mom. So I think throughout treatment, he became more focused on him and managing his emotions and focusing on himself and not always worrying so much about mom and what mom is doing and where she's at and you know, if she might overdose one day or if she's in jail. Or So I think he became more focused on him and doing things for himself, making friends and doing well in, in school. I want him to be not on drugs, be nice and be a happy family. Making this documentary has been like running into a brick wall. It made me realize I was living in denial. I wanted to show the effects of crystal meth on families and I was hoping that I could make this movie and show my daughter and she would get off crystal meth and straighten up her life and all would be well. I love my family, but my family's dysfunctional. 
My son and Paul are still drinking. Amber is now in a residential rehab center. I've learned that I can't fix or change my family, but I can only change myself. I've gone back to school. I started slowly to some community classes, the West Side Leadership Institute, and then I went to the venture course in the humanities, and that led me to get to the University of Utah. I am no longer afraid to talk about the problem of addiction. I can't fight this problem alone. I hope this documentary will open doors for people to talk.